So just gonna do some hand quizzes today. I think we'll start with these most recent three and go from there. So let me mute this. Hang on. There we go. Now you guys will be able to hear this. And then we'll start right here. All right, today's hand we have ten nine of spades on the button. We are facing a min raise from the cutoff, who opens with about thirty big blinds. Should we fold? Call re race to eighteen hundred or go all in. So <clears throat> this player only has about uh, what is that three hundred? So six thousand is twenty. So like you said, about thirty big blinds. We have about forty. Um, I think I like three betting here. Ten nine is just so strong. Um, there's an argument to be made for calling, but the problem is we don't want to get squeezed by a short stack, right? So we don't want to incentivize them to go all in because this is a min raise. If we make it 18 and this player jams for 6K, he knows we have to call. So his shoving range is much tighter, actually giving us an ability to fold. But if we just call it here, his shove, we'd have to call 5,400 more. And when it folds back to us, obviously we can't call. So we allow his range to be wider. So I think three betting is the only option here if you're going to play the hand. So we're playing 30 big blinds effective here, and an easy way to think about this is we don't do a lot of 3-betting with suited combos here at 30 big blinds. The reason being is we don't want to 3-bet and have to fold out our equity. Most of our 3-bets here are going to come from hands like Jack-10 off, Queen-10 off, um, you know, Ace-8. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm playing the value of the hand too high, so I should have just lent, I should have just called it. Off, Ace-9 off. More on the offsuit side, more pull. We're going to be very, very polarized. Because the hand is so strong, that's why we can call. So if the hand were like he's saying jack-10 or queen-10 off, because the hand is so vulnerable, we want to 3-bet with it, because in those instances when we make one pair, we win more often when called, versus with the 10-9 suited, it plays better to make a hand post-flop. Okay, I see what he's saying. Guys do a lot of flat calling here. Um, I would flat call hands like aces and kings here as well. 10-9 suits, uh, just a clear flat here. Um, I think I would even like shoving better than 3-betting because at least with shoving, we get to realize all our equity. We go heads up to the flop, and it comes queen 8 four, two spades, and we face a check for our opponent. Should we check bet 600, bet 1,200, or bet 1,800? See, now this is interesting because if I had played the hand and made my mistake... I would have three bet it and now be looking to win a nicer sized pot. Typically, you don't want to get pushed off of a draw. So, like, if we were to bet, meh, yeah, 600, about a third of the pot. If we were to bet that and get check raised, I mean, I suppose we could get pushed off of it, but we have, you know, 12 outs to the nuts. So maybe we check, but uh, like I say, I'm just waking up my brain, so... Personally, I like betting small. It's my bet. It's one of my best draws. I'm gonna, you know, bet with some of my best draws and uh, marginal made hands. So, I like the bet. Here, I think people get a little too excited and just bet 100% of the time because they have a straight flush draw here. Um, betting is certainly fine, but I think checking is also a very competitive option. And I think it's really close between check and bet. I think it should be probably like a 50-50 mix, something like that. We'll get, when we're shallow here, and by shallow I mean playing like less than a 4 SPR here, we're going to be pretty polarized with stack to pot ratio. So he's saying when we have uh, less than 4 times the pot in our stack. So the stack is, you know, if we have, you know, uh, the this player only has about 8,000, is about 2,000 in the pot. He's at a 4 to 1 stack to pot ratio. We're at more, but we're playing for his stack effectively, so... That's, the, that's what he's talking about. If it was less, then the decisions are much easier. Uh, if it's more, the decisions are much easier. Uh, they get they get harder as the sta as it's more, sorry. So like if you have a 15 to one stack to pot ratio, now when there's a lot of action and a player's that willing to get in that much that many chips, because that would mean a player with you know 30,000 here into a 2,000 pot. <coughs> That would have been, you know, it gets much more complicated because he can have so many more bluffs, he can have so many more value hands, and his stack does so much more damage. So, just a thing to be aware of, stack to pot ratio.
fair betting range. Um, we're going to be bluffing with a lot of hands like ace deuce, ace three, ace five suited, ace six suited, some king, you know, king jacks, king tens. Beep. Positional bluffs that don't really have much chance to improve. So, like, if we just called it with, like, the ace six of diamonds or something or, you know, whatever. Just hands that really don't do very well unless they make their draw combo. Like, one pair with ace, you know, eight suited isn't exactly that great, uh, especially the ace. But, you know, when checked to... When the board doesn't seem to have helped the opener, then we can just bet and take it down. So it's just positional bluffing, really. Pretty polarized, not betting a ton of 8x or 4x or pocket fives or sixes or sevens. I think people bet those hands too much. This hand, 10 9 suited here, fits um, well into a betting range because we can certainly get all the money in here. But it also works very, very well as a check. It protects our checking range, gives us. Yeah, like I was saying, I don't think you're ever going to fold if you're check raised here. So. Yeah, so we have enough equity to call the check raise, so that's the benefit. Because, like, if you had a hand like the ace deuce of spades and a player checked and you bet and then he raised, you kind of don't want to get all the money in right here, but with the backup of the gut shot and the flush draw, it's kind of so much equity that at worst you're 50-50. Flushes, we have some disguised um, straights, etc., and so I think it's really close between check and bet here on the flop. And if we are going to bet, I really like betting the small size, 600. We don't really want to be betting large here in position. We want to bet small, force our opponents to defend with a wide range of hands, or check and play turns accordingly. Um, I do check back this time. Like I said, I think checking or betting 600 are both fine. Ace of hearts on the turn. Our opponent checks again. Should we check, bet 600, bet 1200, or bet 1800? Um, part of me says we could set up the barrel, but the ace is usually really good for our opponent. Um, honestly, I think I'm checking here. Um, although there's nothing going on. I mean, I, uh, we didn't bet the flop. Okay. We didn't bet the flop. <sighs> and I guess... I guess we want to just get hands like jacks out of there. So I'm going to go with the same answer, bet small. But if I had bet the flop and then that card hit, I would take the free card off on the river. But I think we just bet small again. Once our player checks the turn here, we have another very interesting decision. This is a turn card we want to be pretty polarized on. Uh, so I didn't and bet enough. immediately that should start to um, get you thinking in that we should be betting geometrically. Now what I mean by geometrically is right now the SPR is 4. opponent has 8,000 back. There's 2,000 a pot. So with an SPR of 4 over 2 streets, if we bet pot, pot on the turn, that will leave us with a pot size bet on the river. So what a geometric sizing is, is betting equal percentages on the, of the pot on the turn and the river or over two streets. So here if we bet 2,000, um, there'd be 6,000 in the pot. Our opponent would have 6,000 back. So we have even equal weights betting the turn and the river. Now here, um, I think 10, 9 of spades here is pretty close. We want to be really polarized uh, when we're betting here. So we're betting like our really good aces and... Some hands like 10-9 no flush draw, jack-10 no flush draw, some king jacks and king tens, maybe like a deuces or... So I guess I thought about it too deeply. I guess it is fine to just make a bigger bet and threaten the player. Um, but here's my problem is that if we make that, well, you know, I'm not going to argue with the coach. This is a great coach. Uh, I'm not going to argue with, with his point of view, but in the tournaments that I play you get further by betting multiple streets than you do by betting bigger on any individual street. Now, the benefit of betting pot here is that we have a ton of outs. When we hit them, uh, betting the river is not so, you know, betting the pot on the river. So, because he said, like, the geometric betting, we're reducing the stack to pot ratio for our opponent. So, if we bet 2,000 here and he calls the 2,000, he only has 6,000 left. There's 4,000 in the pot. It's not unreasonable for us to bet, you know, or there's 6,000 in the pot. He only has 6,000 left. So it's not unreasonable for us to just bet enough to put them all in. My problem with that is, in the tournaments that I play uh, at the lower buy-in levels, is that these are that's not the kind of betting that gets folds. My version of geometric betting at the lower levels is threatening their stack reasonably, not completely. Completely would be putting them all in. 
Uh, but players are more likely at the micros to call all in than they are to make a bad call and be left with 25% of their chips just because they're like, well, if I'm wrong here, then fuck it. I can walk away. You know what I mean? Like there, there's something to be said for that. So I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Uh, I think my bet on the turn realistically probably would have been my bigger bet if it had been there of like, yeah, 12 to 1400, somewhere in there, probably about 13, 1400. Then if the player calls it, Let's say we did 1300 there's 4600 in the pot, he's got 7000 left, and in the river we can reasonably bluff for, you know, 4100 depending on how we feel, maybe a little, maybe under 4000 works better, but, um, and in that case, uh, it's like the player has to call on the turn and the river, and it's like he's really kind of got to have something at that point, uh, like a decent ace, like... I think Ace Jack can make that call for sure, but I don't think they like it. And uh, I definitely know that, you know, Queen 10 can't make that call, and Pocket Jacks cannot make that call. Kings can't make that call. Um, I think your minimum hero call after that betting is, uh, yeah, the Ace Jack without the Ace of Spades, right? Because if I had like the Ace five of spades and I made that bet on the turn and river and then the spade didn't come off you're beating me with your ace jack but because I have the ace of spades I know you know where the where the nuts are you know what I'm saying so I could just be betting that so I don't know it's interesting though threes or pocket fives um, some worse draws than this um, we're going to be pretty polarized here now 10 nine of spades is certainly good enough to bet but again I think it works really well as a check to protect our checking range so we have a flush we can have straights. Um, and our hand is just really good, and checking is a very competitive option here in position. So I think checking um, and betting uh, 1,800 here is the answer I put, so almost full pot. I think you can go 2,000 as well. Um, both very, very, very good answers, check or bet. I don't like the smaller sizings, though. And um, if you look at a solver, if we bet 2000, if we bet 1,800 here, our opponent's supposed to start folding hands like queen jack some of the times and king queen some of the time and just continue with like draws and like ace x hands and i just don't think population folds enough queen x hands here um and that's why i slightly prefer checking rather than betting uh but against really really tight opponents i think betting large is good but against sticky opponents like i just don't think people fold hands like queen x here enough on the turn to a very large bet which makes me lean towards checking here a little bit. Um, I don't like my size in here. I chose 1,200. I think I should be betting 1,800 here or checking. Yeah. Um, our opponent calls. At least And the river is the seven hearts. And our opponent checks. Should we check? Bet 1,600. Bet 3,200. Bet 4,800. Or go all in. I mean, this has been like the worst run out possible for our hand. The ace on the turn changes the dynamic. The hearts on the river changes the dynamic. People don't bluff raise rivers very much at all. So I think. See now I don't I don't go as deep as uh I can't remember his name, this coach. I don't go as deep as him um because most of the players I'm playing against are surface level. All I'm gonna say is I don't like betting thirty well what's a third of the pot? A third of the pot is like 11, 12, so 36. I think I would like betting 36 on this river for about three-quarter pot. 36 to 38. You know, 34 to 38, depending on the player. Um, I think we do have to definitely threaten his stack, but, um, you know, we can fold if we get raised. I mean, I think how often does a bet have to work? I guess 3,200 is the closest. Uh, to me, it's a little too close to half pot, which is just a bad bet. Um, I like my bets to be more defined. So my answer is not up here. But 32 is pretty close. 34, I think, was my minimum. 35, somewhere in there. Um, hmm. I mean, at this point, we're representing hearts. Because we could check the flop, which is back to our heart draw, pick up a heart on the turn, you know, bet and then get called, and then pick up a heart in the river, and then bet, 
And then, so if that's the case, well, there's a lot of merit to going all in here. Like just two, you know, having an SPR of two to one and just jamming. Because it's very hard to call us with one pair, and I think that's what's going to be going on a lot. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna go for the jam. I think because if my bet were here like 3,800, I would think that's fine. I think just over pot isn't great, so I think the jam here is the move. Believe it or not. Nah. We get to the river here with 10 high. Obviously, we don't have much showdown value, but I think we need to be very careful with how we bluff. And in general, we just want to have a. So um, I guess the answer was 3,200. Part in our hand to be bluffing here and more even more importantly we don't want to have spades in our hand uh, when we bet the turn our opponent's calling range looks a lot like ace x some queen x hands and then spade draws and our so this is why i go with the smaller bet on the turn and then the medium bet on the river because in the players i'm playing against they are going to have a lot of queen x they're not going to have a lot of uh hearts uh typically they're usually never going to have an ace because they're always going to th going to see bet the ace. Um, it does suck to have the spades in our hand. Yeah, I'm still waking up, man. That's why this stream is called Wake Up With Me. So I'm coming to the answers, but uh, my brain's not firing on all cylinders yet. Still getting my caffeine in. Art draws. That's a majority of their range. And part of that range just made flushes. We don't want to bet with spades because we want to fold out spades. And... Um, I just don't trust, like, even if we shove here, which is the preferred sizing when we do bluff, they're supposed to be mixing folds with... All right, give me a little credit. I found the preferred sizing when we do bluff, okay? So give me some credit for that. Asex hands, and I don't know how often people, if people are folding enough Asex hands here, um, I don't trust them to enough. Um, I think checking here is probably the best play against population, and, and, and in theory... My problem is, is that when we check here and he shows us pocket jacks, because because in because in play this hand was bet one time, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I would have when it was checked to on the flop, I would have bet a reasonable c bet. On the turn, I would have barreled, and on the river, I would have had the setup for the bet bet bet. In that case, it's very hard for him. He's never going to have ace queen. It's very hard for him to have queens. You know what I'm saying? He's not going to have spades, I know. You know what I'm saying? He could have heart draws, but I think when betting the turn, you know, if you make the, you know, the good size bet on the turn, if somebody has a heart draw, I think there's some chance that they jam, especially if they're, like, got a combo draw with us, like five, six of hearts, which is highly possible. I mean, it's a little loose to be open. No, it's not. It's fine to be opening that in the cutoff, so that's very possible, the five, six of hearts. Um... Also hands, I mean, if the five, six of hearts is there, then the, you know, the nine, seven of hearts is there, you know, the, uh, hmm, I guess the nine, well, the nine, ten of hearts is obviously there. Um, but I think, I think most of the time here, we're going to be up against one pair and it very well could be a hand like jacks, nines, you know what I'm saying? And like, you know, a lot of people put, check back the jacks on, or check the jacks on the flop because they're like, eh, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Like, and then they, the ace comes off, and they're like, well, fuck, now I really don't know. So, personally, I like betting right away on the flop. Like, bet 600 on the flop, and then we're looking at, uh, let's see, the, the pot was 2,000. So, we bet 600 on the flop. That brings it up to 3,200. My dude, how is it going? Where did you where did you get that quiz? Uh, Gray Fox, this is off of a site called PokerCoaching.com. Uh, if you don't know about it, it's one of the best training sites uh, I think in the world and here's the thing it's the least expensive and there is so much content bro it's crazy uh, I'll talk about it right after we finish the quiz I'm not sponsored by them I'm not an affiliate you get no discount through me I don't even have a code I just think it's amazing I've already renewed my subscription twice now so I've had it for a little over a year and a half I honestly it, it completely changed the way that I think about poker like now in my head every hand I go through uh, different ways of looking at okay in this blah 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 scenario what's my range look like here what do i do if this guy does that this guy does this all right let's finish the hand it's the best play i don't see we get a lot of how much is it uh they have sales all the time uh i got mine i was able to lock in my price on a uh i believe it was an independence day sale uh yeah 
about two years ago, two Independence Days ago. So I get it for about seven hundred a year, um, and that's just the one-time payment. Then you renew. Uh, it goes for a lot more, but there are specials all the time. And uh, I sent him an email because I told him I like to do these quizzes uh, on stream, and I use their stuff, and I'm a big proponent. I sent him an email, and they said it was cool to do the quizzes. You know, they don't have a problem with that. Obviously, I'm not sharing all the content. And uh, you couldn't. I mean, there's so fucking much. Um, but they don't have an affiliate thing going right now. So they, you know, I said I just wanted to give a discount to people. And uh, they said that that'll be coming in a few months. But there's literally like 40 coaches that put together brainchilds on this thing. And the courses are dense. I mean, it's my results have gone through the roof since uh, going through their tournament master class. And I was already a good winning player. So over folds here it really depends on. Uh, if they call way too much on the turn, then it's a possibility of getting overfolds. But maybe they call a few X Queen X hands. But I think we want to bluff with mostly like hands like King of Hearts Jack or King Jack with a heart, King Ten with a heart, Jack Ten with a heart, Ten Nine with a heart, uh, and then stuff like pocket deuces, pocket threes, pocket fives, even pocket sixes a little bit. If we have those hands, though, we don't yeah. bluff the turn. Mostly like deuces and threes. That's where our bluffs are mostly going to come from here. But the most important thing to know here, and just an easy way to control your bluffing frequencies, especially against people that you don't think will fold enough, is you just bluff here when you have a heart, and especially when you have a heart and no spades. So like king of hearts, jack of clubs. Then you just shove for one and a half x pot here, and you're going to have more than enough bluffs. That plus, you know, your jack ten. With Been following me for some time. Yeah, man. Appreciate that. Yeah, uh, I, t I was away from it forever. Uh, for about four years and I only just started 18 days ago again and now I'm back on the stream full time a heart shove with those hands and then you shove with your flushes maybe some ace jack with a heart for, for thin value and like two pairs and sets and stuff and you're going to be doing just fine here um, so I think you should check here um, I did bluff I bet 80% here I don't think I'm getting a huge overfold here he's supposed to call with most of his ace hex hands and I think most people don't fold an ace here so I really just don't like this bluff. <laughs> 2016, that's awesome. Not that, I'm like, I'm not creating it. Over. Okay, here, here's the thing, here's the thing. This is the bet I said I would make. When when this is over, go back and look at what I said. I said I would be betting about 34 to 3,800 as played. And it worked. Overfold here. Um, he's supposed to call with an ace. I don't think people are gonna overfold with an ace here. No. So I really don't like my bluff. I think checking and just giving up as weak as it seems is the best play here. And this is why I call a lot, because I think people just bluff too much in these types of spots. So um, We do get it through this time, but I'm not too fond of that play. I mean, it's an over-bluff spot because of the way the hand played out, but if it was set up normally, like betting the flop, betting the turn, betting the river, then it's very reasonable, and you don't risk any more chips than you did. Uh, so I, I, I agree with the theory on this hand, but in practice, I think, especially for the lower levels and the micros, I think my way works an excessive amount like 90 plus percent yeah man that's back when uh, uh, I was in Canada I think and uh, yeah I quit uh, a little while after that because they didn't have the uh, sub thing for affiliates back in my day you had to be a partner to get uh, a sub button and uh, you know to actually like get some revenue off of twitch and I was just putting in so much effort and it's not like I needed to get rich off of it but like it's very hard to dedicate that much time and effort and then every third comment when you're hosting a thousand you know uh follow or thousand watch or stream every third comment is where's your sub button and it's like well you got to talk to scott ball he was the head of twitch poker at the time and uh i don't know why but it just never happened so i got pretty bitter and just quit twitch altogether and uh you know kept playing poker ups and downs you know so we're in a rebuilding phase right now uh, so that's why it's Qui-Gon broke, not Flippa anymore. <laughs> but uh, plus I wanted to make the channel something that I really enjoyed doing. And I like Star Wars more than anything else in the world, pretty much. Uh, so I decided to theme my channel around it. And there's a exclamation point, uh, what is it, uh, commands. You can see all the different uh, reasons and things for my name change and everything else. And some stuff that's happened to me and how I've evolved as a person and as a player, I think. But yeah, man, this, this fucking site, like, I'll just take you through the site, man. It's pretty awesome. The courses, the quizzes, like, just, just the quizzes. Let's go to that. 
Like that's what these are. And believe it or not, these are a great way to learn poker. Like I do them in the mornings just to wake up my brain because like I know all the things he's saying and I understand all the theory. But you know, when you just wake up, like I've only been up like an hour. I had breakfast, walked the dogs, fed them, and you know, just kind of sat down at the computer and I'm getting my morning caffeine in and uh, and I'm just like, my brain's just not ready yet and I'm planning on playing you know, tournaments. So it's like, okay, well let's warm up with these, getting my brain thinking in the right manner. And uh, here's the thing, these are all those quizzes. We just did this one, like these were posted today. These three were posted today. There are literally, and I've done hundreds of these, over 1400 entries in these. It's insanity. Nobody could go through just the quizzes. Like, I know guys who just grind these out, and they're just nowhere close. And then there's things like the classes and the challenges and the homework and the play and explain, hand reviews. You know, uh, there's tools like, you know, sh push fold charts. You can create your own push fold scenarios uh, on this thing. I mean, this is fucking awesome. Like, you have the poker coaching app on the phone, there's free books, you know, GTO pre flop charts. You know, it, it's just fucking insane. And there's even like, uh, you know, these crazy courses. These things I think are the the solid core of the site. Uh, this thing, Tournament Masterclass, when I renewed all my progress got wiped out, I've actually completed this and I restarted it again. And when I say completed it, I mean I would do one small section of one small thing a day. And then I would make notes and that was it. It took me like three months to get through it. Do you play on Poker Stars? No, I can't play on Poker Stars, man. I'm in Las Vegas. Uh, so we're not allowed to play on that site. That's why I went to Canada, was to play on Poker Stars and Party Poker and at the time Full Tilt and 888 and all those ones like that. That's why I took that six months trip to Canada, which went okay. I definitely wasn't uh, as good a player. Um, my wife likes to remind me that I did run very poorly while I was there, but I think there was too many things going on in our lives at that time for that to be an optimal situation for me to do really well. <laughs> so I did okay. I made a few final tables and I think on the poker side I broke even, but I wasn't covering the cost of you know living. So when we got back to the States, we were kind of you know uh, screwed. Fun fact, you can spend 180 days a year in Canada as a US citizen and uh, you don't need a visa. You can just go up there. You just need a passport. Not anymore? Has that changed? Pandemic. Oh, the pandemic. Well, the pandemic, they've blocked us entering, right? Yeah. Can they yeah. Enter? You have to be a Canadian citizen. Yeah, no, I'm just talking about the law. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like, right, once the pandemic's not on, we could do that. But, yeah, that's going to that's gonna suck. Maybe next year we can. Yeah. Pandemic changed the world, man. And it's still going. <laughs> it's fucking insane. Yeah, it's not over, people. It's, it's really not over. And if you look around Vegas... You can see the effect, but you can also see the dumbest people in the world coming out here for a vacation because they think getting a $20 room is a good idea. Rooms aren't even cheap anymore. They're not cheap anymore? Rooms went back up. Oh, my God. I saw something where the last year, one of their first weeks were back up to, like, 400 And it's just because of they can't mandate <clears throat> lockdown anymore. <laughs> so people need to make money, man. It's the one thing that if people didn't know it, that's kind of the one thing you should have learned from the pandemic is uh, regarding your well-being with the government, you're, you're on your own. You're, you're pretty much on your own. <laughs> like the amount of fighting that we had to do to get our benefits was fucking ridiculous. But yeah, this site's just awesome. And I really love it. And I was thinking about, you know, I wanted to invest in my, uh, you know, my, my poker game. And uh, I had read like, like over 300 books at one point and uh well more than that and um i was like you know what the training site is where it's at now like you can only learn so much from books and you know videos and things like that that you find for free and you know watching people stream and all like that but this is like really in-depth specific stuff did i get covid no i did not uh knock wood luckily me or courtney didn't get covid before we got vaccinated um, so we still haven't had it, but we've both been fully vaccinated and, uh, I got really fucking sick on the vaccine though. <laughs> uh, I guess it's not hard to get an infection and get infected in Vegas. No, it's not. Uh, we are, you know, among the many other things, we are one of the leaders in the country.
It's like Florida than us, <laughs> pretty much. Arizona was going fucking bananas though for a while, like which is kind of weird. But yeah, and it's never been hard to get an infection in Vegas. You know? what was that uh, what was that joke in The Hangover? What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, except except for syphilis. Except for syphilis. That that shit follows you everywhere. I said that last night. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Nike, thanks for the bits. Your co cousins were like, what? Yeah, like, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas because one of my aunts was smoking or something like that. Yeah. And I was like, except for syphilis, that does not stay in Vegas. That goes with you. You get that. Yeah, get that? You take it on home with you. Take it on home. <laughs> my one cousin, she's older. She was like, she's like 60 something, 65. She was like, well, then let's not do anything where we get syphilis. <laughs> I mean, I guess you could get it from smoking a cigarette if it was inside somebody, but I don't think oh, I don't think it's that common. Honey. You got to go to Thailand oh, for that honey, usually. That's disgusting. <laughs> you ever see those videos of the girls who smoke with their? <laughs> I just feel like poor vaginas. I mean, it's crazy. You know, her cunts up to two packs a day. It's really. <laughs> <laughs> Got to two final tables, uh, I guess that's last night, and Victory tried opening up a little bigger, must have helped. Nice. Yeah, uh, oh, you did. Oh, Nike, that's awesome. This is this is a good point, and it, it just shows the difference between sites. Nike was saying yesterday that he's going to go play these tournaments on WSOP.com, but, you know, and just get called by five or six people, and we got real serious with it last night. And I was like, dude, open bigger. I'm like, trust me, you have to play these things like they're live cash games. Open fucking bigger. And uh, my man gets the two final tables and a victory last night with that one tip. <laughs> you gotta know stuff. No, you gotta send that tip, man. He did. He sent me uh, some bits. He sent me like uh, 25 bits. Nice. Yeah, bits are fun. I, don't, I think that's my first bit donation since I've been back uh, streaming. So that's nice. Yeah. Jesus, but uh, <laughs> I appreciate that, man. But congratulations, bro. I'm glad to see that it worked. Yeah, there's simple solutions to that. If you're getting called too much, just open bigger. <laughs> I mean, it's it's one of those things that seems so obvious now, right? Must have, must have been pretty uh, uh, nerve wracking when you were first doing it, though, because I remember when I made that decision on WSOP, and I was like, "This is risky," and then I just realized, "Oh, this isn't risky. This is the easiest thing in the fucking planet." And it's just like, just because you're putting more chips out there. But congrats, man. Let's play an Evan Jarvis one. Hello, everyone. Evan Jarvis here for PokerCoaching.com. Today we are reviewing another tournament hand from the $2,500 buy-in World Poker Tour Falls View event. I played earlier this year and made a decent run-in. Very fun hand coming your way. King six suited on the button. We have a raise from our friend Marlin. Poker stars and bet MGM, yeah. Love to play on those sites again. Yeah, honestly, man, I mean, it, it's one of those things that would be nice, but I think we're still looking at like another three or four, yeah, maybe maybe four years before Poker Stars is like, because they're in like Pennsylvania and New York, but that's just like the interstate playing pool thing, so they're not playing with the rest of the world. You know what I'm saying? Like once the once the U.S. Uh, market is opens up to the rest of the world, there'll be another poker boom. Uh, just because it's fucking crazy, and um, but that's not going to happen until they change a bunch of laws, and that's going to take time. Who is a poker coaching member? Shout out to Marlin. Uh, I met him at the series before. He was running. Yeah, you know, he had a good stack early on in a tournament, and asked me what to do. I said, "Dude, just be patient. Pick your spots. You know what to do." He ended up winning it, and so we took a picture together at the end of that trip. And then he was very excited to see me for this one and to play with me. Uh, maybe less excited by the end of this hand, but uh, let's get into the action here. He opens for 2.4x from mid position. He's going to be opening, you know, a solid GTO range here. Actions on you on the button. What should you do with the king six of hearts? Should you fold, call, three bet to 2,500 or three bet to 3,700? Um, the only thing I don't like about some of the quizzes that Grips does, he's a very well thought out player, um, but. Um, it's a little too player specific. So he has history with this player. He knows this player and we don't have all that information. But that being said, 
versus a player who's going to be playing more solid. I'm not going to three bet because players who play on the on the tighter side of aggressive, their strongest pre flop. So obviously we don't want to play this for a four bet. You know what I'm saying? So I think we just call. Yeah, we incentivize the blinds to squeeze, but we have the button, man. That's pretty strong. I'm just I think this is a call 100% in this scenario. Now, in the past, I definitely would just fold this hand. I'd be waiting for hands like king nine suited at the minimum, maybe king ten suited. To be fair, king six suited is a pretty shit version of it. You know, it's almost as it's like the a six suited. You're really only playing for the flush. But um, in today's game, I think you can you can flop with these. I guess three betting though is um, no one well, here to get involved uh, and be more selective of the spots I got involved with, but. I've been studying at PokerCoaching.com. I've been watching some Alex Fitzgerald videos. He told me I needed to look to look for spots to three bet, okay. and that the button was my best friend when looking to three bet, and that suited hands and blockers were good candidates for three betting. So. That's very true. When you're on the button, you have all the power, and uh, suited hands get an extra 13% of equity, and having blockers like a king, queen, or ace, sometimes a jack, but not really. Um, it's very important because it makes it less likely this player has ace king, king queen, you know, hands that might want to, you know, four bet. It's less likely he has kings, aces, you know, all that kind of shit. Would be a dream to play with US, but I think it's quite hard to do that now. European players can't play with Australians. Yeah, Australians have been locked off, man. Like, I saw something on Poker News that they're, like, really getting housed uh, by, the, uh, by the regulations in their country, which is kind of ridiculous. Uh, yeah, it's not so promising. It's really not. I mean, for other parts of the world, I don't know how it works, but in in America, it got promising when Sheldon Adelston died, um, and generally a better country. Uh, but <laughs> when he died, uh, because he was the main proponent against online poker, and it was actually in one of Biden's early bills, let's allow U.S. players to play online, and you know we'll tax them and regulate them, and it'll be fine. You know, just like it should have always been, and. Uh, it got muddled in some. It was it was in a bill that was that ended up getting proposed that got voted down, and it's like they didn't, couldn't just vote on it by itself. It had to be an under an underline, so it's one of those things that like it had to get voted down because it was like, do we not help people in the pandemic? And then they voted that down, and it was just like, okay, well, thanks for putting the poker one in there. So, um, I've seen some strong players flat here. To, you know, just play in position. They're three betting the cutoff with king six suited, but they're flatting the button because they're guaranteed to have position. I, I do. Uh, that's what I was coming with. And my main thing is we have 84 blinds. This guy has 54 blinds. So we have more than him and he's got a big stack. I think that makes a better case for three betting because we reduce the stack to pot ratio and we threaten him greater in position. So I disagree with my original decision to call specifically in this situation. I think three betting is 100% the move, specifically because of the stack sizes. I think I think I missed that. For the rest of the hand, um, it's a hand that they're gonna be able to realize their equity fairly well with in position. But if we check our trusty poker coaching charts. These are amazing. Uh, the, uh, all, these charts big are on, stack. all these charts are on pokercoaching.com. For every single spot, for every single hand, for every single scenario, you have, what do you do? So we're on the button, right? Uh, where is it? Button versus low jack, high jack, uh, raise first in. So the button, we're sitting on the button, and the low jack raised first in. What do we do with king six suited? So we just find king six suited. It's one of those hands that's not good enough to call. King eight suited is good enough to call. King nine suited has a good enough amount of equity that we can raise. King 10 suited is too good to raise. You know what I'm saying? So like, it's one of those spots where it's a good hand, but it's not good enough to call. You must raise with it. Otherwise, you're f without the fold equity, you're not going to win the hand often enough. And it's interesting because you'll see stronger hands like ace deuce, ace four, ace five, not raising because they have so much power to them. And meanwhile, hands like ace six, ace seven, ace eight, raising because they're the worst combinations of the suited aces so it's, it's interesting the stuff you can learn just from the detailed charts i only play with michigan people that's why it's so soft this is a good place for poker three casinos 30 minutes away four if you can uh if you count canada yeah that's true plus these charity poker rooms are the worst dudes ever yeah i've heard about those man i've heard those are just uh <laughs> oh i mean granted people are playing for a good cause so they're not obviously the most serious players but 
I, I think we had a deal. Yeah, it was in Florida. It was my first dealing job ever. I did one dealing job in Florida because they came to the school and they asked for the, the teachers, because I was teaching at that time, to come out and do an event. And the idea was we were going to teach these players how to play. Uh, and then we were going to deal a poker tournament. And it was all for charity. So we had to have, uh, I had a tux, I had a rented tux that they actually provided. And uh, I was sitting there, it was 98 degrees, and we were outside. And there were misters above top of us, right? So they were like, oh, we got the misters, that'll be great. It's like, okay, I'm in a tuxedo, it's in Florida, it's 98 degrees. The cards they gave us are regular Hoyle paper cards. They weren't even chems. So it, like, you would go to deal the cards, and if you didn't put your full finger behind it, it would stick to your fucking hand. You'd cause a missed deal because the, the card would be sitting right here face up. It was so fucking brutal. But, you know, we went out, we taught these people how to do it. And then I saw the tournament get played. The third hand of the tournament, I got tapped out, moved to another table. And my foreman, who was managing the thing, was my boss from the thing. He goes, how's it going? I go, that guy in the two seats going to win the whole thing. And he was just a player with a basic understanding of ranges and uh, we put 20 bucks on it. And uh, he said, versus the field. And I was like, yeah. And he gave me like five to one because it was betting, or no, four to one, because I was betting on one guy versus the field for 20 bucks. And sure enough, the son of a bitch won it. <laughs> and I was there all night, so I got to deal him on the final table. It was kind of fun. That's because we are pretty deep. We see that King Six suited on the button when facing a raise from middle position falls into the three bet category. Um, it's just on the verge, which means it's not quite strong enough to call. And we see those hands I was mentioning earlier that I'd wait for. The suited kings, king 10, king jack, king queen. These are hands that are strong enough to flat call. But with the hands that are not quite strong enough to call, but do have a blocker. It's an interesting concept that I had to get in my head, which is there are hands that are too weak to call, but too strong to fold. And if that's the answer, you have to raise. So it's like... So you're telling me I can call, hey, what's up, Punisher? How you doing, man? So what you're telling me is I can call with King 10, but I should raise with King 6. Like, that was a crazy concept to come to, and I only came to that shortly after getting on this uh, site, training site. But uh, it, it's an interesting concept that now I, I see every day uh, when I'm playing, and I'm like, oh, well, I have the position, I have the stack, I have a blocker, I have the suit, uh, you know, the suited hand. Uh, this hand kind of sucks, though. Okay, I raise. And just because of all the other factors, you give your hands so much more power post-flop. And when you play good poker post-flop, you know, it's kind of the move. ...are suited and are maybe feeling like they're a little bit too strong to fold. These are the hands we want to use for our three-bet semi-bluffs. So that's what we do. As for sizing, uh, we want to go for a larger size that does have some fold equity and puts pressure on our opponent. If we go for the min three-bet, he's calling with everything. Um, and we want... Said, I'm good. Just got mail from PokerStars. My account will be closed tomorrow because of regulation changes in the Netherlands. Oh, no. Oh, dude, I'm sorry. Do you play on ACR? <laughs> if you don't, click my link below and get a sign-up bonus at 27% rake back. <laughs> and I'll give you 10 bucks after you make your first deposit. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, man. That sucks, bro. You're playing on ACR right now? All right, make another account then. Sign up under me. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I'm just being funny. This is the other... Uh, what? <laughs> a black woman just uh, set the new world record for deadlifts. Oh, wow. A uh, woman's bra world record of... How much does she weigh? 36 pounds. She weighs 140 pounds, right? No, she a big girl. Oh, is she? She a big black girl, blonde hair... Big ass hoop earrings, breaking fucking. Oh, records. Amazon. I oh, she's the heavyweight. How much did she lift? Six thirty-six. Oh wow, she's got to be about one hundred eighty. Jesus, wow, she's a big bitch. She is huge. That's a huge bitch. But I love that she has her hoop earrings on, no matter what. That's a girl after my own heart. Right. Fun fact for y'all: don't see too many black women leaving the house without earrings. It's really uncommon. Like, since since we were together, I, I look, mm -hmm. it's fucking bananas. Like, the amount of, I've, I think there's only been, like, a few incidences a year of all the people we see where I'll see somebody out without, a black woman without earrings. Oh. It's fucking crazy. It's such a thing. It's our thing. I mean, and culturally, in Africa, it's a big deal, so. 
not just earrings, just it's part of like your tribe, you know? Yeah. Oh no, I get it. It's cultural. So you regged ACR only because of you four years ago. Oh, nice. Figured I couldn't plan it because of the name. Uh, yeah, no, that's not true. You can absolutely play on it. You could even play. I mean, there's four different skins. There's like black chip poker. They just America's card room is the main one, but you could even have an account on black chip poker, and you're playing with the same players. Now, obviously, you can't play on them both at the same time. The computer doesn't allow that. But you could play on a different skin for the same thing with a different name. <coughs> So I guess I should get a black chip sign up, but I don't use black chip poker. I just don't think it looks as good. Let's see. Let's we want keep going. To, let's, we want to both put some pressure on his hands uh, when we're bluffing as well as build a pot when we have a strong hand. So those are the reasons why we want to go for the larger three bet size rather than the small three bet size. Three bets, 3,700. I feel like this is going to be a bet, bet, bet right away because of the sizings that he's giving us for the next action. So I think this is going to be a three barrel. Marlin calls. Flop is queen of spades, ten of diamonds, six of spades, giving us a pair and putting a whole lot of draws out there. He checks to us. Action is on you. What should you do? Should you check bet 2,400 or bet 4,800? It is a live tournament, but what we're going for here is betting a third of the pot so the chip denominations aren't going to work out perfectly. So I think 2,400 is fine. We're going to bet all... We're going to always see bet here after we've three bet pre flop in position because we're just trying to like win the pot right away. But we're also setting up a bet, bet, bet scenario where we have to make the bets on the turn and river as well. So I think the answer here 100% is 24. If we think about his Seven. range for opening and calling a three bet, he is going to have quite a lot of Broadway cards in that range, which means he's going to have connected with this board pretty well. Whether it's a pair, a gut shot, an open ender, two pair trips, we're not sure. Oh, wow. So the Netherlands was allowing poker stars to operate without a license. Oh. That's what fucking the U.S. did originally. But people didn't know then that you needed licenses. So they're like 10 years late on that shit. Just like, nah, fuck it. The they didn't, they didn't, the they didn't gamble. Well, yeah, but it's like, that's the thing though. The Netherlands is some of the freest, uh, you know, uh, parts of the world. Like you can you have so much personal freedom there. It's insane. So I guess that makes sense that they wouldn't charge them a gambling, you know, uh, thing for taxation. But, oh, that's right. Lex Veldhaus. Oh, no. Lex, yeah, that's right. Lex plays on Poker Stars. Holy shit. Oh, I mean, he plays on a lot of sites. But, um, ugh. That might cause Lex to move. Oh, that would suck. I mean, I was watching him last night. He had like a thousand players. One, he probably has a house somewhere abroad. Eh, that's usually not a great investment <laughs> to have a second home. And Lex is doing good, but it's hard to maintain that. He just bought a house and got a and, and a baby. Yeah, exactly in the Netherlands. So he's probably not going to move. No. Yeah, I mean, but there's plenty out of their action for him. Who be operating with license is not, operating with license is nothing shocking, but there are other countries, but do not have any regulations. Right, so they were taxing, uh, but without charging a gambling license, so no regulation. Hmm. Interesting. So he's right here. the The range here does can contain a lot of Broadway cards, and in that instance, I think you lean more towards checking, uh, or betting bigger. So, well, no, I think betting a third is still okay. Um, I like betting. I when I don't when I'm when I'm on the line. I err on the side of aggression, so I bet that's kind of a me thing. But you know, this is a live tournament. I don't play a lot of live tournaments, so uh, I, I'm interested to hear what Grips says because Grips could almost be considered a full-time live pro. As much as he streams, he does get in a quite compact uh, live tournament schedule. But he's going to have hit this board quite a bit, um, and so if we have the best hand. We don't have a huge equity advantage, and so it doesn't make a lot of sense for us to build the pot at this point. What makes sense for us to do is to try to get to the showdown with a hand that may be best, but not by a ton, and do that for the minimum. Two ways to do that are the obvious play of simply checking behind, which is what we would do with a lot of hands on this board. Uh, we can also consider betting very small if we think our opponent is passive, is not going to be check raising very often, 
and then we can check back the turn, get two cards for the price of one, and have the best chance to get to showdown and see all five cards. That's the other benefit. When the player calls you, he's going to give off something with his timing or tempo, or your lives are even going to get even more tells. So I like the bet on the flop even more because of that, because you do buy the turn, you know what I'm saying? Like, if the turn comes off and it's like a jack, or if, even if it's an ace, um, you can then safely check back with your equity of a gut shot, you know, and getting two pair or trips on the river to most likely have the best hand. And he's right. If the player is very aggressive, like if this was me, right, and I had the ace or the suited ten, right, the ten king of spades uh, or the ace ten of spades, um, I would be looking to check raise here. So you're going to get blown off this fucking mo nonsense. I'm going to check raise a lot of king queen suiteds um, just because I, <laughs> I know the removal. Um uh, I'm definitely going to check raise king jack or queen jack suited. I'll tell you that right now, because not having a king in my hand, it's far more likely you have just ace king, um, ace queen. I'm for sure going to check raise. Well, no, I'm going to call with ace queen, but ace queen with the ace of spades, I might check raise. No, that's opposite. Without the ace of spades, I might check raise. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm definitely check raising kind of a lot of my range but like he said this player is a little bit more tight i think a bet is quite fine lex is a poker stars pro so he cannot play on other sites i guess he is going to move out to play other sites yeah he's probably gonna have to leave poker stars but wasn't he playing the venom i mean he could play the he played the venom didn't he like i think he did i think he's allowed to play on other sites i'll look up in a bit i assume he saw this is coming and has a plan uh, I don't know, man. Like, governments tend to just drop this shit very quickly. Like, if Poker Stars knew, that's one thing. But, you know, if they just, like, stop their operation, uh, who knows? Because, like, Black Friday just came out of nowhere, man. One day I was, you know, grinding out a living, and then Black Friday happened. <laughs> you know, so who knows? I don't know how it went in the Netherlands. I imagine they're more civilized than the U.S. was back then. Um, personally, I know that Marlin is capable of check-raising and... Right, government just dropped this shit out of space. That's exactly what happened on Black Friday. Spots like this, especially if you hit the board reasonably hard. So I just checked back. Take our hand one step closer to showdown. We did have the second best answer with betting small. And see how the equities uh, adjust on the turn. Fortunately, they adjust very well in our favor. Six of diamonds gives us three of a kind king kicker. We're only losing to queens and tens at this point. And now Marlin bets 5,000. And let's be fair, the guy never has queens here because he would have four bet that, I would imagine. Uh, even in a live scenario with that many big blinds. Yeah, because you're only at about like two and a half starting or one and a half starting stack at the start of this hand. Uh, so, yeah, the queens are never there. 90% of the time, they're never there. I think 10% of the time, you just call with queens. Uh, as a live player here, it's more online for sure, uh, but they're not that tricky. Um, so now we're just protecting against flush draws, we're checking against straight draws, things like that, ace king of spades, king jack, you know, things like that. So, but we do block those. Um, so now when he bets, thousand into eighty seven hundred. Two draws out there with the suits plus the straight draws. A lot of draws out there. What should you do? Should you fold, fall, raise to twelve thousand five hundred? Remove all in. Here's my feeling, and I feel like this is going to be wrong in this context. My feeling is there's 8,700 in the pot. This guy just bet 5K. Uh, it's not a huge bet, but it's not a small bet. This to me is one of two things it's a bad bluff, right? This is a legitimate bad bluff. This isn't our bad bluff sizing where we try to get calls. It's a legitimate bad bluff. A blockery it's a little big for a blocker um but i think most of the time this is a player who thinks he's trapping so the most likely traps with this betting scenario are 10 10 which if he has that congratulations you win um but other than that trapping scenarios are ace queen which we have crushed uh pocket kings which we have crushed Pocket aces, which would play this way. Kings and aces would play this, you know, no four bet pre flop. We have them crushed. Um, and all draws. So, because of the most likely factors that are the over pairs, top pair, top kicker, which we have destroyed all those, 
and draws, I think the only move here is to go all in because if we call the 5,000, they'll be 18-7 in the pot. He'll have 19-5 behind. And this is where I think Grips is going to get it different because that's about a one-to-one -one SPR. On the river, there's really no folding going on. Uh, unless we have a super read that the player just has diamonds and a diamond comes off or spades and a spade comes off. But I'm not a genius, so I'm not trying to be psychic. So my move right here, especially in a live tournament, is to ram a jam a lamb and uh, get all the money. There is some merit to re-raising small, right? Raising small to 12-5 because then that means he has to call 7-5 and he's got 12k left. It's very likely he will jam over the top of us with specifically aces uh, and all draws, but then we've priced in the draws, so I don't like that. So I'm going to jam a lamb, and we're going to see what happens. Well, it can be scary, intimidating, for there to be many draws out there. Be fearful that a draw may come. Um, doesn't mean that we need to raise to protect against them. I think we get called here a lot. I'm not I'm not raising to protect. I think we get it we get called here a lot by hands we crush and all the combo draws. And in that scenario we love it because the combo draw thinks he has nine spades and the ace and the jack, but he doesn't because he can't hit the king of spades. He can't hit the ten of spades. You know what I'm saying? I mean like there's only seven of those and then there's three cards on either end. He can't hit the king, so he's only three cards on one end. So I, I think we get called here in a scenario where the player thinks they have more equity than they do because when the fuck do we ever have a six, right? Like, we could have played ace-queen this way for sure, for sure, and then the kings just snap, the combo draw snaps. Granted, I, I, this is a 2,500 WPT falls view, which has an interesting dynamic because it does have a lot of regs, uh, but this player is obviously a good-thinking player. He did win the other tournament, Grips was saying. So I think this one gets kind of muddled. I still like my play best. I really do. Yes, there are some draws out there. There are also many hands he have that aren't draws. And if we raise here, we fold out all of his bluffs, maybe even fold out a hand as strong as a pair of queens, and we limit the amount of value we get from those hands. True. Uh, it's important that we don't force his bluffs out and force his... Marginal made hands to consider folding as well. And that we just call here. All right. Uh, we keep in all his bluffs this way. If he has a pair of queen. I see his point, but I think this is retroactive perfection. I, th I think this is a scenario where the hand's going to play out perfect. Like the king of spades is going to hit the river and we're going to get it all. But we don't know that here. So I think this is one where... Because I'm not really doing it to protect. I'm doing it to get the money in. You know what I'm saying? Right now, before the river comes off, I want all the money in. Because on the river, if somebody has two spades and a heart hits the river, they're not giving me any more money. You know what I'm saying? If they have ace-queen and a diamond hits or a spade hits, they're not giving me any more money. I, okay, okay, Grips. I'm with you. I'm with you. I agree with your theory here, and I do agree sometimes. And maybe, maybe, like I said... Grips does have some very specific hands that he does with specific reads he has on certain players. So maybe knowing everything he knew, this would be the 30% of the time where I would have just called this. Maybe. Uh, if I know that the player is always going to play this way with king-queen, and then when the draw misses on the river, he's just going to jam into me, or he's going to call my jam, you know, bluff catching, like check call to bluff catch me, and uh, bust, you know, bust me. But I think you'd have to have some very specific player knowledge for that. So, my two cents. Uh, he's more likely to think it's good. He is more likely to put us on maybe a hand like a pair of jacks or ace-king high that's checking back to try to get to showdown, willing to call one on turn, but may fold to the river. All so true. It also opens up the door for a lot of potential. To be fair, we do have the monster right now. We have the completely hidden monster. So, by not betting the flop and then checking, you know, checking and hitting the trips on the turn, it's kind of bananas. Our hand could definitely look like a set of tens or queens, that filled up on the turn, you know, check the flop. Like, pocket queens would play the exact same way. So I get it. But the, the difference is, with pocket queens, we're in no danger of draw, being drawn out on. And we just have the board locked. So it's a little different. The bluffs to come from him on the river. River is a seven of diamonds. With that's an action killer, okay? Definitively, that's an action killer. We should have the seven of diamonds, or we should have the diamonds draw here. 
when that hits, it's an action fucking killer. He should not be betting at all right now unless he has the ace of diamonds in his hand and the and a queen of, you know, whatever. But he could definitely have the nuts right now on us. So we're not going to be able to raise whatever he bets here. If he goes all in, I think it's a snap call. But we're going to get shown the nuts as much as we are one pair when he does that. Which completes the 8-9 double gut shot as well as the backdoor diamond draws. He bets 11500 in a 19000 Action is on. We cannot raise. Yeah, you really need to look into positions and ranges. Yeah, dude, that was what getting on this site really helped me with. The tournament master class, I mean, I'm a MTT tournament player primarily, so that's why I went into it. But honestly, it got so deep into ranges, and it's done by Jonathan Little himself. And Jonathan Little, if you don't know him, is a GTO, fundamentally sound robot. Like, some people find him even hard to listen to because of the way he talks, because he goes, when this player does this, we do that, and we do this. And it's very cut and dry. And he's going by the math of it. He's done through the solvers. He's you know he's got his ranges perfectly memorized. I watched the guy play live, you know on I watched him play online, uh, not live online, but I guess he was like streaming it. And I was watching him, and he's playing sixteen tables with no buy-in less than fifty-five dollars. And he was ranging from fifty-five dollars all the way up to like five thousand. He's playing sixteen tables at once, and. He doesn't even care what the buy-in is. He's doing the exact same thing on every fucking table. Like, he's like, we raise here, we raise here, we raise here, we fold here, we do this, we fold here, we fold here. And it was fucking bananas to watch. The man's a machine. So for me, for the way my brain works, he talks simply and plainly and concretely. There is no debate. There is no doubt. We're in game. Let's go. Uh, so for me, that works great because with my learning disabilities, you have to be very clear. Um, in my own time, I debate things like this. This is where philosophy comes in. But at the time, when I'm in game, one, two, three. We, we have a fundamentally sound game, and we go by Sun Tzu's philosophy. When your spear hits flesh, continue forward. When your spear hits metal, continue back. That means if we hit resistance, we change. You know what I'm saying? We advance, we keep advancing, making our bets, being aggressive, until somebody gives us a reason not to. Then we'll adjust. But... Raise three pre-flop, I'm betting like 90% of flops for a third of the pot, no matter what hits. You know, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. So we can never raise here. This is a snap call uh, just because we're so strong. Um, but we can never raise here. And if we had gotten all the money in on the, like if we had jammed the turn, it's very hard for him to call with just a flush draw. Like if he had a combo draw, I could see it. But it's very hard for him to call with just a draw, but it's very easy for him to call with top pair, top kicker. So I think when he bets here, He's going to have better than that a lot. Uh, the bet is kind of bad, uh, meaning it's usually value, which means we usually win. So this is either uh, the ace-queen or the king-queen, right? Usually the ace-queen with the, with the ace of diamonds. Um, but I think that would have bet more. So I think we're going to see one pair here a lot, and I think this is one of those retroactive perfection hands uh, that was played by Grist. <laughs> what should you do? Should you fold? This is a call. call. Or go all in for the min raise. Zero point of going all in. We're only getting called by things that have now outdrawn us. I feel like Grips is going to say I got that wrong too because of his player-specific history, but it's just a call, man. We, we missed out on the 8K behind by not playing the hand my way. In this situation, Let's see. there, there tips, was the part of me that was... Any tips on where I find it? I assume... It's a matter of, I get a matrix of position and hands out of 2002 or 2020. No. Uh, Gary, you never go all in here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain that to you. If you go all, go all in here, what is calling you? Right? If we went all in on the turn, right? If we went all in on the turn, all the draws can call us, right? Which is fine. All the ace queens, right, can call us. That's fine because we look like we have a draw. You know what I'm saying? Even ace-10 of spades can call us. And versus all those hands, we're actually crushing. Like, we're 60%. It's fucking bananas. And here's the other thing. Aces wants to get all the money in on the turn. Kings wants to get all the money in on the turn. Right? They don't want any more of these draws to come off. And we just so look like we're, 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 we're you know, semi-bluffing. So the turn is where the, all the money goes in. With my strongest hands, I want all the money in. That's what I'm doing. That's simple. It's a very good way to win. So when we're on the river, he bets half his stack here. If we raise him, you have to ask yourself the question, what is calling us? Flushes. 
Yeah. Full houses? Yeah. Are aces calling on this river in a $2,500 buy-in? Like, think about the action. Check on the flop. He bet the turn. Then he bet the river. And we jam. Do you like pocket aces there? You shouldn't. What hand is doing that? <laughs> like, what actual hand is doing that? Right? It's crazy. Right? Like, you definitely don't like it with ace-queen. So you're not going to get paid. You're only going to get caught. That's the problem with this river. You know what I'm saying? Eight, nine, you know what I'm saying? Like, all these hands. Like, we're not getting anything that beats us twofold on this river. The point is we wanted things we beat because we have such a disguised hand. Like, think about it. He raises pre-flop. We re-raise. He calls, right? The flop goes check, check. All right. The turn. He bets 5,000, a reasonable bet. We just call. The river comes off, completing a diamond and straight draw. He bets half his chips, and we put him all in. What do I roll over? Pocket queens, pocket tens. That's it. Ace king suited in diamonds, a fair whack, because we have enough uh, equity to check the turn. But even then, I think it's only because of the size of the bets that we're getting it in. But even then, I don't know if we raise with even the nut flush here. Because he could easily have queens and tens. That's the thing. Who's got the queens and tens? So we can never raise here. If we raise here and get called, we're losing 100%. 100%. Unless we just know this player is an absolute fish burger. You know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, the tips where you can find uh, the, um, the position in hands... Uh, go to pokercoaching.com. They actually have a free membership and you can get access to all their pre-flop charts. So you can try out the premium membership for 30 days, but they do have a free membership where you get access to the hand quizzes and the pre-flop charts and a lot of stuff like Jonathan Little's books. You just get them free download. So go to pokercoaching.com, sign up, do the free trial. You can do the free 30-day trial of the premium, but I would save that until you learn to navigate the site a little bit because there is a lot of information. So do the free trial. Check it out. Go, oh, I want to check this out. I want to check that out. Cool, cool, cool. You'll have access to all that. You can see the little lock next to what you don't have access to without premium. Make a list and then go for the premium trial. Yeah, thanks, man. Too bad they have no affiliate program. It really is. They, they do have one sometimes, but uh, I would see the river from Griff's. I'm, I'm getting there. Trust me. Uh but, uh, yeah, they, I, I sent them a letter about the affiliate program. I'm going to get it uh, when they have it. They just don't have the program at this current time. But when they get it, I'm going to have it. And I tell you, my goal is to be good enough and well-known enough and win enough that Jonathan Little one day sends me an email that he sends to all his coaches to go, hey, we'd like you to do some hand reviews for us. That's what I want. I want to meet the man because he's improved my game so much. It's insane. All right, let's finish the let's finish the quiz. Concerned if well if I call and he shows me diamonds, nine suited, I'm gonna look silly. But so what? Um, there are also king jack that missed, ace jack that missed, jack nine that missed, all the spade draws that missed. He could be betting a queen like this. There are so many hands in his range that we are beating, and there are a few hands that are beating us as well. Uh, but overall, there are enough hands that we're beating that we can definitely justify calling here. We only need to be... We, we can only justify calling. We can't justify raising. We can't. There's no fucking way we get called by something that we beat. We only need to show a winner here like about 25% of the time. And if we break down his entire range, we would see that... I get the whole stack here on the turn when he rolls over aces, kings, or ace, queen. Remember that. But there are way, way more bluffs. Uh, than just one out of four in this spot and and hands that are value betting um, that are worse than ours like a pair of queens queen king ace queen so um, you know the fact that it was a large bet I definitely felt it a little bit so if you feel that in those spots when you're playing tournaments don't worry you're not the only one even your coaches feel it too uh, but once we get past that element and just run the numbers and recognize that we have the best hand here a far 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 majority of the time and we are so high up in our range there's no way we are ever folding in this spot and there is also no merit to moving all in for the extra 8k because he's not going to call with a queen for an extra 8k uh, he'd only call with the times he has us 
this is uh, an easy call and a win for us. He shows ace jack of hearts. And this is one of the powers of three betting in position and taking your opponents out of your. This is a retroactively perfect hand because in this exact scenario, we don't get all the money on the turn. But this is super rare, super rare that he's leading into a three better on the turn. This is a bad play. We three bet preflop, and then he leads into the three better on the turn when the three better checks, and then he decides to bet the river when he's called. This is a bad play. That's straight up what this is. This is only a bad play. You have us on all the draws because you have none of the hearts or diamonds, or our hearts or uh, or spades or diamonds. He he's unblocking those. Yeah, no, this is shit. This is a bad hand. It's a retroactively perfect hand. I think the example of the hand is good, but I think I like it better if they didn't show us the answer. I think, because Jonathan Little will do that sometimes where he'll be like, and this happened, and we won, and we take it down. I don't need to see this hand. This is the play of a bad player. I think I'd rather not know that he has that because that's going to color my opinion of him. This, this is now a bad player. And here's the thing. He had a little, you know, poker boner for, for grips. Maybe he just wanted to show him a bluff real bad. And that is a factor when you get known. Uh, but for general study, I don't think this is an awesome example by showing the, the hand. I think this is one where, yeah, he should have shown uh, a king six suited. Right. Well, well what's, what's his hand that does this here? Ace, queen, kings, aces like so much more powerful like honestly like he played it wrong because here's what here's what you can do you can call the three bet pre-flop and then check check the flop and then on the turn you can check or you can bet small you don't have to bet that big bet that he made of five thousand right but if you just check the turn obviously i'm gonna bet now right or maybe if i feel like you're just super weak i'm gonna check and then when I check the river, if you bet and I just feel like you're full of crap, I'm full of crap, I think I can take it down, then I can make a bet, and your river bet is only going to be like trying to get one street of value with this crazy disguised hand. Your river bet's only going to be like 15000 No, not 15000 excuse me. It's only going to be like f at most 5000 It's probably going to be like 3000 And then I can check raise you for ten k, right, on this river. When it's gone, check, 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 check. And then I check the river, and then you bet the river for like three or four thousand. I can make it ten thousand, and then you go, "What the fuck?" And then you might actually fold the king six. Like I did that in a tournament two days ago to a guy, and uh, he actually showed me that he had a uh, top pair. I think he might have had two pair, honestly, uh, but he showed the one card uh, on ACR. So that move to me has way more merit. Plus, you save seventy five hundred chips when you play it that way. If you really want to go for a bluff against your poker hero. It's like, the, it's like they said in rounders. Johnny Chan shows up, sits, you know, 300, 600. And the, everybody in the casino, soon enough, there wasn't a crap game going because everybody in the casino sitting down to say, oh, I played with a world champion. And they're giving their money to this guy. That's the thing of being known. Gripst is well known. You know what I'm saying? So this is a scenario where he's specifically getting this bad player to make a bad play against him because he's Gripst. And the guy just really wants to show him, ha ha, fuck you, Ace Jack, you're my hero, but I beat you this one hand. Then he takes his role, goes to K Teddy KGB, and almost gets himself killed because his friend Worm fucks him over. Like, everybody has this fucking fantasy. And in reality, when you're trying to play poker for a living, that's not the way you fucking do it, bro. You don't even play this way for glory. Like, this is not glory. This is fucking retarded. The glory here is getting three bet by Gripst on the button, and four betting him with the ace jack. There's your fucking glory. You know, I mean, it's just ridiculous. So, no, I don't agree with this one. It is a good example of a hand, but he should never have shown us the ace jack. Never. Comfort zone is that a lot of times they will overplay their hands. Um, he's not overplaying his hand. He's over bluffing. When they think you're kind of capping your range on the flop and they want to try to take the pot away. How is my range capped on the flop when I three bet pre-flop on the button and then check the flop? How is that capping my hand, my, my range at one pair? It never is. Capping your range means you can only have one pair, right? It also means you can only have the nuts. But there's a lot of shit in the middle of there. There's tens, queens, sixes, aces, kings, jacks. Like, there's a lot of shit in there that has a lot of value that I can continue with. So you're not capping your range by checking this flop. If anything, you're keeping your range wide. I think C-betting the flop keeps your range wide. 
betting big on this flop caps your range. You know what I'm saying? If you three bet pre-flop and then you bet three quarter pot on the flop, you're then capping your range to one hand. It's a very good, very good, or to one pair. It's a very good pair, but that's how you cap a range in this specific scenario. Way because it's a big pot out there and people like to fight for big pots. That's one of the things we typically see on the poker tables, uh, in tournaments and in cash games. Once the pot gets big, people do not want to give up on that pot. And that's why uh, three betting in position with quite a few hands can get you in a lot of favorable situations where you can win a lot. This hand that in the past I wouldn't have even played, but because I opted to play it, had a nice run out and did not make the mistake of raising on the turn or folding or raising on the river, was able to increase my stack by about 20,000. Quite significant uh, when we start with only 30. Anyway, this has been Evan Jarvis for PokerCoaching.com. Hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, he increased his stack by 20,000, but it should have been 29,000 the majority of the time this betting structure goes down. You got to look at poker for me. It's like a decision tree. If this, then that. If this guy raises and I have king six on the button suited, then I raise. Okay, cool. The flop comes down queen 10 six. If this, so that's the if, I go ahead and see bet range. He calls. That's the if. He calls. Then the turn comes off a of six. Then I'm going to uh, check back turn. And then river, he's going to bet. If this, then that. Then I raise the river. So it's that decision tree thing that if all these little things happen, you can get to the best decision. This is one that, granted, Grips did well in this tournament. And I. this is like the second or third example I've seen from this tournament specifically where they were sp situations that were far too specific and specific to him because he is grips and people want to play against them. They want to stack, you know, get against the guy who says get stacking, you know. So I think the hand is a good example overall. I think most of the time we're going to get all the money on the turn when the guy has aces, kings, or ace, queen, uh, or some kind of draw, like the spade draw very commonly, or the king jack very commonly. Um, as played, I don't think it's a great example specifically. But generally it is. All right, I'm going to try to do one more. $215 tournament online. Faraz Jaka. I'm re I recognize the voice immediately. Uh, fantastic coach. Super genius deep thinker. It's king of hearts. We open to 230 here. Big blind calls. Flop 764 with two diamonds, one heart. Checks to us. Do you want to check back? C bet 180, C bet 300, or C bet 500? Uh, honestly, this is one of those. I turned it down a little bit. I know this his volume's a little higher. Um, honestly, I want to check back here because the hand does have enough showdown value on its own, and we don't want to get bet off this hand, right? Did you ever watch uh, Dan and Linger play on Twitch? I saw some crazy bluffs by players versus him. Yeah, exactly, right? Uh, it's because they're playing against that player specifically. Tonka gets a lot of that too. Uh, people like to bluff Tonka because he's such a high level, unshakable player. But I've seen him just pick off some bluffs where it's like, well, this is ABC. And then the player just shows him complete trash insanity. And it's like, he has to realize those are hands that are just happening because of that. It's like if you've ever played a tournament and you're doing well and you're crushing and for me, this happens quite a bit. I, I won a live tournament, uh, I guess it was about two and a half months ago now. Yeah, I haven't played live in a while. But uh, I won this live tournament, and players were giving me way too much action because I was only allowing to, to, to let two or three stupid comments go. And unfortunately, my arrogance wouldn't allow me to just let them keep being stupid. So I just started telling people how fucking dumb they were. And I was winning the hands, and this guy was like, well, I figured you had this. I'm like, you didn't figure that. You hoped. And I'm like, I was just like, I was just being a fucking jackass. And it worked for me because at that point, they were just dying to, to beat me in a pot. So I could raise rivers and just get them to fold, I, you know, with anything. And I could get totally paid off by acting passive. And then every time I lost, you know, they, they lost a pot to me, they'd be like, you're lucky. I'm like, no, you're fucking awful. You're horrible. And I would just, I just, I just hated these people. And I was so glad I won the tournament because I had such contempt for all of them. <laughs> they were such jackasses. And it's like, and I was just trying to be a nice guy. I was having fun. I was talking to people. I was telling jokes. And then there were these four or five guys that just started, 
I guess they were regulars and they just didn't like somebody coming in that they didn't really know, you know, plus I had the nails and I'm kind of loud and all like that. You know what I'm saying? And it wasn't really a strategy. It was just something that came out. Oh, yeah, I like that strategy. It was just something that came out of my personality where I was just like, fuck these guys. They've been sitting in the same chairs in the same casino for 20 years doing the same things. And one day it's going to work. Fuck you. It doesn't work that way. You have to be more active than that with your training. And if you're not going to train, then look at it as recreation. Don't get mad when I fucking trounce you. Uh, so let's see here. Uh, so like I said, I'm going to check back here. We do have backdoor hearts. We have overcards. We don't want to get blown off it here by somebody with a seven. So I, I think we just check a lot here. I think that's smart. Uh, you see. But you need to keep it cool and know your plan. Uh, I'll agree with that to a certain extent. But once you have your ranges and your strategy and your overall philosophy of poker down, you can kind of talk as much as you want and like I've I've won tournaments that one I won it a fiery ball of anger like I was just so mad at everybody every time somebody got knocked out I was like fuck you I was like it was so bad oh damn defended the big blind with a7 off flop shows a7-6 dude had ace-ace yeah it's a cooler what are you gonna do what are you gonna do man that's that's a that's a one in 390 yeah it's a 1 in 390, man. <laughs> There's nothing you can do. Uh, so let's see here. So yeah, I'm checking back because of all those reasons for the value of my hand. And we win a lot in showdown without a bet here. We're doing a ton of checking on this board. It just nails the big blind. Uh, I think betting is okay. But if I was going to bet fold, I would rather bet fold my other ace kings that don't have the backdoor flush draw. I'm definitely going to want to peel with this one, and it just doesn't feel great bloating the plot. So I really like checking here. If you think your opponent doesn't check raise enough, then I think betting is okay. But I definitely prefer mostly just checking back here. Turn is the king of clubs. Do we want to check it back? Bet 240 or bet 500? This is interesting because a hand that's obviously very good for our range after we've checked the flop has hit. So I think that there's some merit in checking here. We are very early in this tournament. Everybody's about the same. That being said, <laughs> I like to bet my hands. And we're going to be up against a ton of draws. We have no ranging yet on this player. He could have anything. And he's going to call us with any pair. He's going to call us with a five. So I think we can go ahead and get some money in the pot. I don't want to bet it too big because I don't want to bloat the pot and then just get an obvious draw smashed on us. Like if a three hits the river, right? and we had bet small, and he leads at us for a reasonable value bet, he could also be, or, or a big bet, he could also be bluffing, and we want to be able to pick that off cheaply. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just bet 240. I think it's fine. Honestly, in game, I might even bet less, but 240 is about right, I think. On the turn here... Although there is a case to be said, I thought about it, for when the best card for your hand comes out just betting big... Because, one, it looks like bullshit for your range. And two, because we're supposed to have all the kings, right? Because we raised. And he's in the big blind. He's not supposed to have any of them, right? Because he didn't three bet. So it's like, when we do that, our, our, our bet looks like utter trash to a lot of players who level themselves. And sometimes he has enough to call us, so we get all of our value on the turn, right? So that's the other side of the coin. That being said, I think I'm 60-40 going to bet small versus betting big, so maybe 70-30. I think checking is a pretty good option. Betting small is also okay. And betting big, I don't like. The reason we might check here is because we've already capped our range. So it is a little bit gross when we get check raised here. Of course, we do want to get value with our kings. So in this instance, by checking the flop, we do cap our range because we don't have an over pair, right? That's known. We basically just have over cards. Um, we could have a lot of draws, I suppose, but really our hand looks like what it is, which is two over cards. And granted, it's the over cards everybody puts you on, you know, the third day that they start playing poker. But he's right. Checking, checking on this flop in particular, because if we bet it, it's like we can have all the over pairs as well as the over cards. By checking... We really can't have an overpair much because are we not going to bet a pair of nines here? <coughs> uh, you know what I'm saying? So uh, he's right. The, in this instance, a check caps our range. 
Um, that being said, I still like betting the turn for small, uh, but I could see the merit for checking because when we can only have over cards, it's better to convince our opponent that we didn't hit the king. Like maybe we have ace queen. We still have just over cards, but we didn't improve perfectly, um, which would allow him to bluff rivers and hero call us with hands like ace four. You know, saying that he only has a pair of fours because he thinks maybe we have ace queen and we missed it. Uh, this this scenario works out better for value when we have ace queen and the queen hits because people are putting you on ace king so commonly that it looks like more of a bluff when you bet. So that in those situations, I'm more inclined to bet big on the queen turn when I have ace queen than I am when I have the king on the turn with ace king. But we do want to be checking back a decent amount after um, capping our range. And of course, our opponent still has a pretty good board. So it's just pretty gross when we get check raised here. And hands like king, queen, king, jack, I actually would be more likely to bet here yeah. because they need more protection. Whereas our ace needs less protection. They have a lot of ace x in their range. So we even benefit when they um, hit an ace and we get to win a bigger pot. That protection thing is a good factor because king, jack, king, queen, absolutely betting for exactly what he said, right? Because if an overcard hits now, right, when we have king, jack, and the ace hits the river, we're... <laughs> We're kind of boned. We can't really get much more value. But when we have, you know, when we have King Jack, but when we have Ace King and an Ace hits the river, now he could have called us with like a speculative, you know, hand or a flush draw. The Ace Five of Diamonds, let's say, right? And the Ace of Spades hits the river. Now he can pay us something because it looks like maybe we got there, you know what I'm saying, versus this guy's King Queen, when in fact we have top two pair. Hot. So betting here is okay, but I really do prefer uh, the check. So we check it. River is uh, 10 of clubs. Uh, opponent bets 240. So we could call. We could raise to 750, raise to 1,050. Really good players tend to like to put themselves in difficult situations. You hear Matt Affleck refer to that all the time on here. One of my favorite coaches, by the way. Um, and now Faraz has put himself in a, different, uh, a difficult position. Uh, I know you can't see the board, but I remember it. Um, where now he's leading into us on the river for small. A small lead on the river is either for value, just trying to get paid by something, right? And now the 8-9 got there when the 10 hit the river, right? But then again, it can also be a bluff. It can also be a value bet that's like blockering, right? Like king, king four, king, you know, king four suited that had a gut shot and a flush draw. You know, he can have anything. He's in the big blind. He's calling very wide. So um, I like raising here i think we can just standard three exit because we're trying to get called by hands that we beat which is one pairs you know i'm saying we beat all the one pair hands and uh we're, we want to be able to fold without overextending ourselves by raising too big so i think three x is fine 750 i'm torn between 750 and 1050 but i think raising here is fine and i'm gonna go with 750 that's fine and this is where we can make up for that check on the previous street if we feel like we're not getting enough chips in the middle. When an opponent bets small like this, we can just raise. So the beauty of this is we let we just let them catch up and hit a 10 possibly. We might have induced a bluff out of them. And when they bet tiny like this, we can pump it up. And I like 750. I think I think 1,050 is fine too. I would be more likely to go bigger if I had a two pair type hand. Since it's a thin raise, we're going a little bit smaller. But um, yeah, either either one is pretty reasonable. The most important thing here is that we are raising though and not calling. And I like that he didn't show the answer. Um, there's, there's literally no reason to because our theory is sound. Now I can tell you with fascinating uh, certainty here that Faraz won this hand uh, because he didn't show the answer. Uh, when If he had lost here, then he would have shown what beat him and why. So 8-9 would have re-raised, he would have folded, and the guy would show the 8-9. Um, or the guy, you know, so in this scenario, I think the guy probably folded out, uh, which is fine. He was just bluffing, you know what I'm saying? We have kind of everything reasonable. 
Um, but if he calls, I think we're going to see the king queen, the king jack, the ace ten of diamonds. You know what I'm saying? That it's just trying to pick off a bluff. You know, things like that. Um, but by not seeing the answer, I think we can very certainly say that this player just folded and they just, you know, they just took a shot. Um, but yeah, I, I love that. And you, here's the thing, those little thin value spots, right? Like we're raising on the river. We don't want to raise too big, but we're going to raise something because we should have it all. You know what I'm saying? You can actually, you know, comfortably raise here. And the idea is this, if I raise, what do I do if he re-raises on the river? He fold. Like that's a fast answer, man. But in scenarios where we raise and get called, we win close to 100% of the time. I think the only hand that beats us is a super trapper uh, that doesn't have the nuts. Something like 7-6. You know what I'm saying? Where he was trying to get more money in the pot, but now we can have king 10. So we're raising, so he can't really re-raise. You know, saying stuff like that. And and weird hands that are two pairs like, you know, king 6 or, or you know, you know. Uh, 710 you know what I'm saying like stuff like that where it's like it's great but it's not fucking awesome it's definitely far from the nuts uh, so I think when we get raised here we just fold obviously and I think that's the problem people have is it's like chess you have to go a little further so if you're playing chess with somebody I don't play fucking chess but it's a great example uh, if you play chess with somebody and they're thinking three moves ahead and you're thinking five moves ahead you're going to beat them all day long just because they're going to make more mistakes before you and you're going to have a plan for what they do in these contingencies. So he bets, we raise, he folds, cool. He bets, we raise, he calls, cool. He we bet or he bets, we raise, he raises, fuck that. <clears throat> pitch it in the muck, man. And this is one where I'd pitch it showing an ace with nothing else and just being like, "Ah, I was fucking around." You know what I'm saying? Or depending on the player, if I thought they were super nitty, uh, I might show the king and be like, you know what? I got kicker problems and just show the king. You know, that's in a live scenario. I, honestly, I would only do that if I really thought there was benefit to it. In a live scenario playing cash, I would, before I fold it, I would say, wow, am I really going to fold ace king here? And then somebody else, and then I'm only doing that because somebody else at the table would be like, you don't have ace king or whatever like that. And I'd be like, yeah, I do. And uh, they would be like, I bet you don't. And Or somebody would say something and I'd go, I'm going to fold, but if you want to pay me 20 bucks, like some small amount, to see ace-king, I will show it to you. And then they'll go, and I'll bet you I have ace-king if you want to take the bet. And then the person would go, all right, I take the bet. And, and I've already folded, and then I roll the hand over and take the 20 bucks. I've done that so many fucking times, it's disgusting. It's just a way to get, get some of my bets back where I got obviously outdrawn on. Uh, it's just a fun thing to do. And live, it's great to do, especially one, two. It's a lot of fun. So it's about one o'clock. Uh, I got to do some stuff. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, host a Sprag. Because uh, I think he's on, right? Yeah. So, guys, make sure you check out Spraggy. He's absolutely awesome. Very good player uh, and great personality. I'll see you guys later at about uh, three or four uh, for my MTT grind. Uh, it's been a great time. Come back every day around noon. I do these wake up with me's. I've changed it to noon. We started early today. Noon is where I want to be, though. Uh, also, check out the YouTube. I've put up edited content. I'm starting to edit things into interesting little coaching things like this. And uh, thanks, man. Appreciate that, Gray. Uh, so go to the YouTube. Subscribe. It's cool. You like the interaction between Lex and Spraggy? Yeah, it's hilarious. Him and Brad Owen, too, have a funny relationship. So check out the YouTube, check out the Twitter. All the links are on Twitch, exclamation point YouTube. Cool. Uh, and I'll see you guys uh, later today.